The 6 o'clock news starts right now. Today marks one year since a Schertz man disappeared, and police are still looking for any information that could solve this case. Jacob Dubois was last seen leaving his home on March 7th, 2021, and never returned home. Erica Hernandez has the latest on the case. Schertz police are pleading for the public's help for information in the disappearance of now 23-year-old Jacob Dubois. Last year on this day, he told his girlfriend he was going to meet up with a friend named Ethan Beckman. Dubois has never been heard from since. Unfortunately, Jacob still has not returned home and the investigation is still ongoing as to where he could be. Beckman, weeks after the disappearance, was arrested and charged with tampering with or fabricating physical evidence. Police would later reveal that Beckman kept giving conflicting stories about where he and Dubois went and what they did that night. They also found that he was involved in a collision on March 8th and abandoned his car near Highway 281 in Johnson Way. Inside, officers discovered that it appeared someone tried to clean the interior of the car. The floorboard was soaked with water. The presence of blood was found near the passenger seat and a spent bullet. In November of 2021, Shirts Police Department announced that this case had turned into a murder investigation. Now on the one year anniversary, they are still asking for the public's help to provide any information on the case and hopefully give some closure to the family. The case is still very active. Uh, I did meet with the parents last week and told them that we are at kind of um, a flow in the case. It does kind of ebb and flow a little bit and we're at the point now we've got a lot of active information coming in and we're just following up on it as we can. As for Beckman, he has not been charged with murder, but he is still in the Guadalupe County Jail on that tampering charge. His next pretrial hearing is scheduled for April 28th. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. New at 6, San Antonio police investigating after one of its patrol vehicles found over the weekend abandoned on a set of railroad tracks east of downtown. Multiple SAPD sources said the vehicle assigned to the department's traffic unit was found with its license plates removed and its laptop missing. That was on early Saturday. The officer assigned to that vehicle said he left it parked at the central substation on Friday evening with the laptop inside. But investigators now doubt the veracity of parts of his story, sources say. City officials have not confirmed whether that laptop has been found. He was hired to work at the Bear County Jail, but now he's in jail after being arrested for child sex crimes. That arrest coming just days before he was set to start that job. According to the Bear County Sheriff's Office, 20-year-old Alucard Harris was wanted for online solicitation of a minor with intent for sexual contact. Deputies say the victim identified Harris through the social media app Snapchat. Investigators also learned that he applied to be a temporary jailer at the county jail. BCSO now says his employment has been withdrawn as a result of his arrest. Harris now being held on a $100,000 bond. A man is dead after slamming his SUV into the back of an 18-wheeler early this morning over on the city's southwest side. Sarah Costa was at the scene early this morning and shows us the damage. This SUV unrecognizable, half of it demolished after crashing into the back of an 18-wheeler early this morning in the southbound lanes of Loop 410 near the old Pearsall Road exit. The San Antonio Police Department got the call just after 345 this morning. The call originally came out as a driver pinned underneath an 18-wheeler. When police arrived at the crash, they determined the driver did not survive and had already died. Police say the 18-wheeler was pulled over onto the side of the highway with its emergency lights on when the driver of the SUV slammed into the back of it. That crash causing the southbound lanes of Loop 410 near the Pearsall exit to be closed for over two hours, backing up traffic on the frontage road. SAPD traffic investigation crews went through the debris, searching for clues for what may have led up to the crash. The driver of the 18-wheeler is okay and not injured. Police say speed most likely played a role in the crash. Sarah Acosta, KSAT 12 News. Tonight, Converse police are investigating a shooting that they're describing as a targeted incident. This happened just before 930 last night in the 10,300 block of Margarita Hill. That's near Topper Wine and Kitty Hawk Road. Police say that someone started shooting there and hit a man twice. The victim was taken to Bamsey in critical condition. 
Not much information right now on whoever might be responsible. Anyone who does know something, ask to call Converse Police at 210-658-0898. Bear County Fire Investigators looking into the cause of an early morning house fire. It happened around 5 o'clock this morning in the 11,000 block of Highway 181 near South Foster Road. Firefighters battling those uh, flames you see there. It started on the porch and spread to the house. Everyone who was inside able to get out. No injuries were reported. The cause of that fire still under investigation tonight. One in 10 children in Bear County will be sexually assaulted before they turn 18. That is according to Child Safe. It's one of many disturbing child abuse statistics in our own community. That's why it's crucial that these children are cared for in a specific way so they can heal. Courtney Friedman takes us to Child Safe, which received a special certification today for what's called trauma informed care. It seems like a small difference asking trauma victims what happened to you versus what's wrong with you. But this trauma informed care can permanently change lives. Tell me your story. Tell me what happened to you. So then that way they're empowered to come forward and really talk about their life experiences. Randy McGibney is the chief operating officer of Child Safe, an organization providing crisis intervention, case management, and therapy for abused children. For years, they've worked on involving trauma-informed care in their programs, and today they were awarded an official certification by the Ecumenical Center. The Ecumenical Center was selected to become the certifying body. And what that meant is that we had to develop standards and domains for levels of certification. Ecumenical Center CEO Mary Beth Fisk said those standards ensuring trauma-informed care include leadership embracing extra labor and expenses, the creation of teams to assess all program aspects, and procedures on things like greeting visitors, like eye contact and not asking too many invasive questions. Another requirement is that the organization provide safe and calming spaces. Child Safe has plenty of those, like this expansive garden in their property. 64 local organizations are eligible for the level one certification and child safe is only the second to get it behind Methodist Healthcare Ministries. McGibbony says these certifications can bridge big gaps in services for abused children. When you have a trauma informed care system, which is multiple organizations who are trauma informed, the child gets treated the same way with the same dignity, the same respect. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. Want to get you to the latest now on the situation, the war in Ukraine. The U.S. and NATO remained opposed to a no-fly zone over Ukraine, but it hasn't stopped President Vladimir Zelensky for his pleas for help. Across the country, the U.N. has confirmed more than 400 civilian deaths, but say that number likely much higher. Another round of talks between Russian and Ukrainian officials shows positive signs of creating a safe way for civilians to get out of the country. Ukraine's president calling the attacks, quote, deliberate murder. We are not prepared for ultimatums. Meanwhile, today, President Joe Biden spoke with the leaders of Germany, France and the UK as the U.S. considers banning Russian oil imports. It's a move the U.S. could make even if other allies in Europe don't join. When you see those images out of Ukraine, a lot of people want to do something to help. Well, thousands of people have found an unusual way. They are booking Airbnbs in Ukraine. It's a grassroots campaign of generosity that is spreading all around social media. I thought, wow, um, I've donated to the to the World Kitchen. I've donated to some other places, but this was a way where I could make sure that my money was literally going to a specific person. And the money gets there fast. Melody Gaken booked five nights at an Airbnb in Kiev. Of course, she is not going there, but she told the host that she hoped he would give those nights to refugees or use that money for his own family. She said she was careful to book with an individual, not a corporation. Airbnb is waiving booking fees in Ukraine right now. Its nonprofit site is also helping people with spare rooms around the world to house refugees. Back here at home, we are waiting on an update on how many Bear County primary voters have had their mail-in ballots thrown out. The state's new voting law, Senate Bill 1, introduced new rules for voting by mail. That included a requirement for the voter to include their state ID number or last four digits of their Social Security numbers on the ballot envelope. The step, in particular, appears to have tripped up many voters in Bear County. On election night, the city's election administrator said more than one out of every three ballot was being rejected. Voters had six days to correct the issue or, quote, cure the ballot so it could be counted. The deadline passed just an hour ago 
at 5 o'clock this evening. Happening tomorrow, VIA will be holding a meeting starting at 7 p.m. to get community input on proposed bus route changes. Tomorrow's meeting will be held in English, and then a meeting on Wednesday will be held in Spanish. Both meetings held virtually. There are a total of 48 bus routes that will be affected by these proposed changes. That could go into effect in May. You can see the full list of those routes by visiting the website that you see right here on your screen. That's viainfo.net slash proposed changes. With temperatures in the 50s today, it's hard to believe, but we are officially less than a month away now from Fiesta. And right now on KSAT.com, we have a full list of all the events that will be broadcast right here on KSAT and streamed on all of our, our website and other platforms. To see the full list of all the events taking place this year, you can just scan that QR code on your screen. A traffic alert to make you aware of beginning tonight. TxDOT will have full alternating closures of Loop 410 and Highway 151 from West Military Drive to Marbach from 8 p.m. to 5 a.m. Crews will be doing bridge work in that area. Now the closure is expected to take place every night until next Monday. TxDOT is encouraging drivers to find an alternate route if you have to go through that area. Sticking with traffic here, let's take a live look at your Monday evening commute here at 281 in San Pedro. A car there off to the shoulder doesn't appear to be affecting much. Uh, fewer cars out there tonight with many people on spring break this week and probably get a reprieve again next week as the other half of schools enjoy their spring break. Yeah, we got some alternating spring breaks around here this year. Not at all feeling like spring break. It's a pretty alternating shot. temperatures. Too. Yeah. yeah, you can <laughs> yeah. see look downtown there. The skies did clear for half of Bear County, but the other half was under complete cloud cover all day long. So uh, we were chilly today, plain and simple. Now the aquifer is down seven tenths of a foot over the past 24 hours. We've got six allergens in the air, but all are low. Guys, I made a literal roller coaster because the temperatures are going to be going up and down. Today we were at 56. Tomorrow we'll be only near 50. Then by Wednesday, 64 and nice on Thursday, 75. But you guessed it, another front since temperatures tumbling. By Friday, we'll be in the 40s. And by Saturday morning, a late season freeze. So a lot to unpack in this roller coaster of temperatures. I'll have a look at that forecast coming up. All right, thanks, Sarah. And also ahead, the latest on the COVID-19 pandemic in the U.S. Why health officials are optimistic the end of this pandemic could be near. We've got the details after the break. I'm Stefania Jimenez, and here's what we're working on for you tonight on the Night Beat. We've just learned that someone's been arrested over a child abuse case over in Hondo. Carlos Padron is accused in a case involving a one-month-old. This is just one of several cases that we've told you about in the last month regarding child abuse. And in many instances, hospital workers are the ones uncovering the abuse. Tonight, we're gonna to meet with those who work at Methodist Children's Hospital. The night team's Patty Santos is gonna show us how they're trained to keep children safe. Also, think of this as an ambulance with wings. Those helicopters saves, save lots of lives in South Texas. And tonight, we're gonna to take a look inside the operation for San Antonio Air Life. Plus, the Russian invasion is leading to backlash, backlash across several industries, including Russian vodka. But the move may actually miss the intended target. We're going to explain tonight. We'll see you for these stories and so much more on the Night Beat. Thanks, Stephanie. Now to the latest developments in the COVID-19 pandemic. As the U.S. continues to ease restrictions, the death toll from COVID-19 now surpassing 6 million people worldwide. Infections, though, hospitalizations, deaths, they're all on the decline. The CDC director optimistic, but encouraging Americans to stay vigilant. ABC's Morgan Norwood with that story. More than two years after the first coronavirus cases began to surface in America, more U.S. cities, states, and agencies are shifting their response to the pandemic. Today, New York City dropping its school mask mandate and vaccination requirement for businesses. New Jersey making masks optional in schools and daycares. I like that we still have the option to do it, and they're not just going to like take our kids' masks off. And even though the vaccine is authorized by the FDA for children ages 5 to 17 and strongly recommended by the CDC, 
and American Academy of Pediatrics, Florida, now the first state in the country to officially advise against vaccinating healthy children for COVID-19. It's deeply disturbing that there are politicians peddling conspiracy theories out there and casting doubt on vaccinations when it is our best tool against the virus. A lot of parents have come up to me and they're just like, yeah, well, thanks for not mandating. We want to make the decision, uh, but they have they have mixed feelings about whether they, they should do that, even, even if it is their choice. And though much of the country continues to loosen restrictions and mandates, a reminder that COVID is still a real threat as the worldwide death toll from the virus now crossing 6 million. CDC Director Dr. Rochelle Walensky telling 60 Minutes, though the U.S. is not quite at the endemic phase in the fight with COVID, she's optimistic we'll get there urging Americans to stay vigilant for potential curveballs that could disrupt the country's progress. I do think that we will get to a place with this disease where we live with a relatively low level all year long and that maybe we have some surges during respiratory virus season. And newly updated forecast models used by the CDC show that 980,000 Americans will be lost to COVID-19 by the end of the month. Another solemn reminder that this pandemic is far from over. Morgan Norwood, ABC News, Los Angeles. Let's take a look outside with Sky 12 this evening. It's a nice shot over downtown San Antonio. If you really zoom out here, Sarah, it was those the area of clouds and, and clearing. It was you can definitely tell the difference. Well, yeah, you can see the west sides of those buildings. They're illuminated by the sunset as the sun is setting. We're going to see a thin line on the horizon of sunshine uh, this evening. It was a cold, blustery day. Winds gust up to about 40 miles per hour today, all behind a cold front that moved through. I want you to take a look outside with the almanac today. The high temperature was actually after midnight, 71 degrees. That was after midnight. That front moved through. And we spent most of the day in the 40s and near 50 degrees. So a chilly day for us. And although some did get a couple of isolated showers, no rain fell at the airport. Again, you can see that thin line there of sunshine as that sun is setting. So it's 56 degrees outside right now. Winds are breezy from the north northeast at 15 miles per hour, but not as gusty as they were earlier. And tonight we're going to see these clouds filter back in and it's going to be overcast by midnight and chilly. Temperatures are going to be in the 40s for us by midnight. All right, a wide view here. We've got a couple of sprinkles across our coastal communities and those closer to Hallettsville and uh, Quero. And a wider view here, you can see very clearly the storm system that brought us the cold front. New York dealing with a severe thunderstorm watch this evening as that low pressure system works its way across the Atlantic. There's the cold front, and here's how much colder it is behind that front. Much of the nation experiencing a second dose of winter here as we head into the remainder of this week. We're going to warm up in San Antonio but then we're going to tumble right back down as we see another cold front arrive by Friday. So let me take you through tomorrow's future cast. We're going to see these clouds build back in overnight and in the morning tomorrow we are going to have some sprinkles with a better chance for light rain showers east of San Antonio. Sprinkles not amounting to much and the increase of clouds is actually going to make it chillier tomorrow than it was today for us. We'll see a clearing line from uh, west to east, but it's just not going to make it to the Alamo City. City. And so because of that, we're going to be cold starting off the morning tomorrow near 40 degrees around San Antonio, mid 40s out west toward Del Rio, even the mid 30s up in the hill country. We don't anticipate a freeze overnight in the hill country, but again, this weekend looks like we are going to see some late season freezes. We'll talk about that in just a bit and tomorrow in the afternoon. Hopefully getting to near 50 degrees, but it's still going to be a chilly day uh, regardless. A little bit warmer off to the west where they'll see a little bit more sunshine out near Del Rio into the afternoon. Uh, 64 for the high in Del Rio, 64 in Carrizo Springs. And across the metro area, a couple of degrees cooler the further north you go. So Bernie and Leon Springs, Timberwood Park, New Braunfels, right near 50. South side of Bear County, La Soya, Almendorf, Von Ormy, about 55 for the afternoon high. All in all, a chilly day tomorrow with those morning sprinkles. And then Wednesday and Thursday, they look good. Wednesday will be at 64 degrees and Thursday will be at 75. So feeling more like spring on Wednesday and Thursday. But again, 
we're going to see a strong cold front arrive on Friday. So Thursday is going to be nice, but that cold front will move through early Friday morning, dropping temperatures down into the 40s, making it windy with gusts up to 40 miles per hour on Friday. And even though cold fronts often bring some rain, we're not going to see good rain in San Antonio this week, and we need it because we're in drought conditions. So Friday, only a 30% chance for isolated showers uh, with that front arriving. And then just as a heads up, Saturday and Sunday morning, we expect a late season light freeze. So some folks have already done some spring gardening. Those plants, uh, they may need to be covered up or brought inside because of that light freeze on Saturday, Sunday morning. At least temperatures will rebound nicely during the day on the weekend. Yeah. We'll stay on our toes this week. Thanks, Sarah. All right, Spurs settling in for a nice stretch of home games. First up, the L.A. Lakers. Greg Simmons is live courtside tonight. Well, and we just got late word that LeBron James is out with left knee soreness. He came out to warm up, only spent a couple of minutes on the court, went back in. So he is out. So odds in the Spurs' favor now to try and get pop to at least tie Don Nelson for the all-time winningest coach tonight when we come back a live preview from the AT&T Center. And the UTSA Roadrunners opened up spring workouts, but it felt more like winter coming up. Good evening, everybody, and welcome live to the AT&T Center, where tonight the Spurs open a seven-game homestand against their rivals, the Los Angeles Lakers. You know, it's very rare to see both the Spurs and the Lakers struggling in the same season, with both on the outside of the playoff picture right now looking in. Spurs are 12th in the Western Conference, three games back at the New Orleans Pelicans, who own the 10th play-in spot. And the Lakers are in ninth, four and a half games behind the Clippers, who own the eighth playoff position. The Lakers just broke a four-game losing streak with a 124-116 victory over the Warriors on Saturday, while the Spurs would like to snap their four-game losing streak tonight. It felt like we haven't had a, a home stretch in, in months, and so um, it's always good to be home, um, back, back where, where we belong. Tonight's game against the Lakers will give the Spurs a shot to help give head coach Greg Popovich to tie NBA history. With a win, Pop will tie his former Boston mentor, Don Nelson, with 1,335 victories. And with the Lakers down Anthony Davis for perhaps the rest of the season, and now LeBron James tonight, that opportunity exists. But LeBron James just came off a win against the Golden State Warriors in which he scored 56 points. How is he able to do that and pull that off at 37 years of age in his 19th season in the NBA? The number one thing is sleep, uh, rest. Um, it's, it's, I mean, I'll, obviously, I'll be able to sleep better tonight than I've done in, over the last few games. Uh, that's just human nature of uh, having, you know, your mind racing and racing and racing and racing on what can you do to help a team get a win. And, you know, figuring out ways you can be better. All right, well, he'll get some more rest tonight because he is out with left knee soreness. All the highlights for tonight's on the night beats. UTSA kicked off their spring workouts today, what should be called winter ball on the Roadrunner campus. That's according to head coach Jeff Trailer. High winds and cold weather is what greeted the Roadrunners today. Put a little extra bounce in their step as the Roadrunners hope to improve on what they were able to accomplish last year. Sincere McCormick, who skipped the bowl game after declaring for the NFL draft back home in San Antonio and back with his former teammates today following his performance at the NFL Combine. Today is the first day to see if the Roadrunners can improve on their record-breaking 12th win season and their first ever combine. Conference USA title, we have Coach Jeff Trader quoting a book called Build to Last, where three-time world bull riding champion Tough Heaterman was asked, how did he able to do that? The bull doesn't care, was his response. No one's going to care that we won it last year. Uh, and we need to have the same mindset. And so we're really studying that book and talking to our kids about the program's or businesses that over 100 years sustained it. And that's what I keep asking our kids. Are we just gonna be a blip on the radar, a flash in the pan, or are we built to last? Do we have what it takes to sustain championship football? The Roadrunners' first three games of the 2022 season are against Houston Army and Texas starting on September the 3rd. Big day for the San Antonio A&M Club as they open their remodeled Aggie Park that features a bigger and better banquet hall. That was filled today with Aggie faithful for the first day since construction began in February of 2020 in the middle of COVID. They all gathered to hear Texas A&M Athletic Director Ross Bjork, who was more than impressed with the turnout. This is my first time here to Aggie Park, so I did not see the old facility, but to walk in and see the pristine nature of this new building and to have people talk about, well, you should have seen the old one. 
I know that the mindset of Aggies is, hey, we can always make something better, and they sure did that here at Aggie Park. All right, now that Texas is moving to SEC, the big question is, will the Longhorns and Aggies renew their rivalry on the football field? The answer to that question coming up tonight on the Night Beat. Live from the AT&T Center, Greg Simmons, KSAT 12 Sports. Thank you, Greg. And we'll be right back. Russia is intensifying attacks on residential areas in Ukraine, bombardments hitting schools, businesses, hospitals, churches, and apartments. The United Nations says so far more than 1.7 million refugees have fled that violence. But local officials say that hundreds of thousands of others are trapped. They're without power, without food, water, or medical help. Isabel Rosales reports on just how far the West may be willing to go to counter Russia. A growing number of states are boycotting Russian-made booze in support of Ukraine. I have no intentions of bringing them back. Officials in at least eight states, including Ohio, Utah, Oregon, North Carolina, Alabama, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and New Hampshire are calling on liquor stores to remove Russian-made or Russian-branded products from their shelves. We sell anywhere around $20 million of, of uh, Russian-based product at any given, over the course of any given year out of the billion dollars or so of, of uh, spirits that we do sell. So um, it does have some impact. But experts say the move may miss the intended target because few alcohol brands are imported from Russia and sold in the U.S. In fact, many of the top-selling vodka brands with Russian origins are now distilled in other countries, including the U.S. Boom. That's how we feel about it. One example, Stoli Vodka, which is only Russian by name. The vodka is actually made in Latvia, and the company is headquartered in Luxembourg. The invasion triggered a rebrand with the company, announcing it will be sold and marketed only as Stoli. Another example is Smirnov. Although the brand traces its heritage to 19th century Russia, the company has long been owned by a British spirits company and is manufactured in Illinois. I suppose if there were a Russian beer or a Russian wine, that's coming off the shelves too. Two of the few vodka brands actually produced in Russia are Russian Standard and Greenmark. For today's Consumer Watch, I'm Jen Sullivan. We apologize there. That story obviously not about uh, actions from the West to hinder Russia's efforts, but the impact to vodka in all of this. Okay, so let's take a look at consumer news right now. Strong job growth across the U.S. now seen as a sign that the grip of COVID may be loosening. Employers added 678,000 jobs last month. That's according to the Labor Department. The nation's unemployment rate dropped to 3.8%. Back here at home, tonight will not be a hard day's night at the Tobin Center. It will be filled with sweet sounds of the Beatles. Mm -hmm. The Youth Orchestra of San Antonio will perform an iconic Beatles album, album tonight, along with sons of Tejano legend Emilio Nevada. R.J. Marquez caught up with Diego and Emilio Jr. before tonight's performance. No, I grew up on the Beatles. My dad took us to see Hard Day's Night. I was like 10 years old, and that was it. The music, you know, stands the test of time. It's timeless, and it's for everybody. Diego and Emilio Navida Jr. are part of a San Antonio supergroup collaborating with the Youth Orchestra of San Antonio's Philharmonic for a live performance of the Beatles' iconic album, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. I've never actually done one with the youth orchestra they have, so I'm really, really excited to, you know, learn from them as well. It's almost like you're in the middle of the record, like dropped in the middle of the record, because we all grew up playing bands that played Beatles songs, but, you know, we can't afford to carry around orchestras with us, right? It's an emotional experience. I was going to say beautiful, like another cliche yeah. thing to say. Playing with the symphonies, <laughs> it's very emotional. Joe Reyes and Chris Madden make up the other half of this Fab Four. When we've done shows with Yosa in the past, we always end up backstage with all the kids and we're just kind of talking shop, but they've already got that sort of spirit in them. These guys are like a Beatles encyclopedia, <laughs> so we all just nerd out on the Beatles together and we're having a good time. We get to play, you know, a great record that not too, yeah, and not too many people play any of these songs live because these songs were designed by the Beatles not to pl be played live. Huh? It's a very fun record. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's very, very fun, and it's very happy. It's very light, and I think everyone yeah. can use that. The live concert is a one-night-only experience reliving one of the greatest albums in music history. You know, we're just trying to deliver what the Beatles created in 1967 as best as possible, so 
Uh, I think a, a, any Beatles fan and people who are, even aren't Beatles fans will really have a good time. Sounds like a good time. That was RJ Marquez reporting. Still ahead on the news at six, the latest on the deadly storms and tornadoes up in the Midwest over the weekend. A look at the devastation left behind in Iowa right after this. Take a live look outside with live cam on this Monday evening. Beautiful sunset after being covered in clouds most of the day here in San Antonio. Some people saw some sun, but uh, not much around here. We want to let you know that story about the tornado in Iowa we're having some difficulty with, but uh, that was a big problem up there this weekend, Sarah. Big problem. A Saturday night, you know, they had an EF4, a tornado across Iowa. And that very same system that brought that severe weather across the Midwest is what swung the cold front through San Antonio today and made it very, very chilly. Although we got up to 71 degrees today, that was after midnight before that front arrived. And we've been spending most of our day here in the 40s and 50s. As Tim was mentioning, some of us got to see a little sliver of sun, sun, sunshine there on the horizon just now as the sun is setting. But these clouds are going to return overnight. Outside right now, it's 56 degrees. Winds are breezy from the northeast at 15. We've already seen wind gusts of up to 40 miles per hour today. Those winds will calm somewhat tonight, but it's still going to be fairly breezy tomorrow with winds gusting up to 20 miles per hour. We are going to see another chilly and cloudy day tomorrow, struggling to get out of the 40s. But if you're on spring break and want some nice weather, Wednesday and Thursday look fairly nice with plenty of sunshine. But just as we get comfortable, just as we're showing suns out, guns out, we're going to see another strong cold front on Friday morning. Late season freeze is going to arrive too Saturday and Sunday mornings. The details for you coming up. In the buzz today, a rare Toyota sold for $2.5 million at a car auction last week. This 1967 Toyota Shelby 2000 GT the most valuable Japanese car ever sold at auction. A large part of its value comes from the fact it was turned into a competitive race car by the legendary Carroll Shelby. There were only 351 models ever built between 1967 and 1971. One was even featured in the James Bond movie, You Only Live Twice. But this one, the rarest of the rare, the very first truly world-class Japanese sports car. Let's talk about something else expensive. New England Patriots owner Robert Kraft reportedly getting a new ring to add to his collection. People magazine reporting the 80 year old is engaged to his girlfriend, Dr. Dana Bloomberg. Fashion designer Tommy Hilfiger announced the engagement at a gala event over the weekend. Kraft was previously married to Myra Kraft for nearly 50 years before she passed away from ovarian cancer. Kraft and Bloomberg, who is 47, are believed to have been dating since 2019. Over in Indianapolis, a 17-year-old climbed up a tree, about 35 feet in fact, up that tree to rescue a cat. Well, he had no trouble getting up there. The problem was trying to get down. Firefighters had to show up first, but they had to call in a rope rescue team who then had to call a tactical team. This took about an hour to get the team down. Other than a few scrapes, he was just fine. The cat made no effort to climb down, though, actually seemed to enjoy all of the commotion. That sounds very cat-like. <laughs> you may have celebrated a special occasion this morning without even knowing it. That is because today is National Cereal Day, a time to celebrate America's favorite breakfast food. Since the end of the 19th century, cereal has been the perfect meal to start the day for millions of Americans. While cereal existed earlier, Dr. John Harvey Kellogg revolutionized the industry in 1895 with his cornflakes. Thanks to Kellogg and rival cereal maker Charles Post, Battle Creek, Michigan became the cereal capital of the world. So have a bowl to celebrate National Cereal Day, whether it's for breakfast or a bedtime snack or whenever you might enjoy it. And if you ever have the opportunity to make it up to Battle Creek, Michigan, roll the windows down. It smells like breakfast. <laughs> I somehow knew you would know about Battle Creek, Michigan. Been there. Yeah. Yep. That favorite, is favorite cereal. Like breakfast. I gotta hey. know everybody's favorite cereals. Oof. What's yours? Fruity Pebbles. Fruity Pebbles, okay. Cinnamon Life. 
Cinnamon Ooh. lime. Or, or those O's. Oh. O's are good. Sarah, I <gasps> love the O's. Oh my gosh. O's and cinnamon Twinsies. toast crunch. Yes. Yeah. Those are so good. good. Delicious. Hey guys, we were talking earlier about how some people got sun and some people were in the clouds mm -hmm. today. Let's take a look outside with the satellite from today and you can see that very clear dividing line. Hill Country, Bandera, uh, Kerrville, and even Bernie got to see plenty of sunshine this afternoon. Meanwhile, plenty of sun in Uvalde, but it was Cloudy out in Seguin, cloudy in New Braunfels, cloudy here in San Antonio. The only thing we can see out there right now as you look west is a thin line of uh, sunshine as the sun is starting to set. Cloudy in Atascosa County as well, cloudy in, in, across our coastal communities, but plenty of sunshine out near Del Rio. And we saw this today in our temperatures. This is a look at today's afternoon temperatures. It was chilly, no doubt, but this afternoon it was much colder around San Antonio Metro area and to places that were underneath the sun, the, the cloud cover today, 55 in San Antonio this afternoon. But watch as you go further out west, it got up to 68 degrees in Del Rio. So this evening, the clouds are going to build back in around San Antonio. We're going to see wind gusts of up to 20 miles per hour tonight. So it is going to be breezy, just not as gusty as it has been during the day. Temperatures will fall into the mid 40s by midnight. It's going to be a chilly evening. And then overnight tonight, we're going to see areas of sprinkles move into San Antonio. Key there is sprinkles, so unimportant rain that will not amount to much, if anything at all. Maybe a few hundredths of an inch of rain, but that is it. A better chance for about a tenth of an inch of rain or more out east toward Gonzales and toward Hallettsville. It's going to stay cloudy all day tomorrow. There will be a clearing line from west to east. It's just not going to make it as far east as it did today, so we're going to stay gray and it's going to be chilly. Temperatures will struggle to get out of the 40s around San Antonio. Antonio and even out to the uh, west, comfortable but cool. We'll be looking at highs in the 50s for Uvalde and uh, Hondo. So tomorrow, Tuesday, waking up at 42 degrees with those areas of sprinkles. You may have to turn the windshield wipers on once or twice as you're going to work tomorrow. And then know that it's going to stay cloudy all day, 46 at noon, 50 at 4 p.m. And winds will be from the northeast, gusting up to about 20 miles per hour. All right, but who wants some sunshine? We are going to get some sunshine this week. We just have to wait until Wednesday when temperatures will rebound pleasantly into the mid 60s and then by Thursday will be our warmest day over the next seven days. We'll be at 75 on Thursday afternoon, but just as we get settled, just as we get comfortable, another strong cold front is going to be on the horizon. That cold front will move through Friday morning knocking those temperatures down into the 40s all day Friday. We're going to have wind chills in the 30s because winds will be gusty. Winds gusting up to about 40 miles per hour. And once again, not a good chance for healthy rainfall with this front. Only a few isolated showers possible on Friday. Another important thing is that we are going to have a late season freeze behind this front Saturday and Sunday morning. This is a look at morning lows in San Antonio. So Saturday and Sunday morning temperatures are going to be near freezing, so a light freeze. We're not going to have to worry about pipes or anything like that, but this will present a risk for temperature sensitive plants. So if you've done some gardening already for spring, know that uh, you're going to have to cover up those plants or bring them in. And an interesting fact is that this freeze will be the latest freeze we've had since 2006. Back in 2006, March 24th, we hit freezing. But since then, we've had uh, freezes earlier in the season. La our latest freezes have been earlier in the season. Our average last freeze is usually around February 24th. So this this is a late season front Saturday and Sunday morning. Thankfully, temperatures will rebound in the afternoon Saturday and Sunday, but we do lose an hour of sleep, unfortunately, on Sunday morning. Still, though, ups and downs and all arounds in the forecast over the next few days. We'll give you updates right to your phone on our Case Out Weather Authority app. Thanks for giving my wife the I told you so because I moved all my plants out of the garage <laughs> oh, last no. week saying, oh, it's not going to freeze again. And she's like, told you so. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. In case you missed it, coming up next. And good morning. Happy spring break for some of you, not all of you, but uh, many. Uh, it is Monday, March 7th. San Antonio police say one of their officers is responsible for the death of a man crossing the street. That officer in his patrol unit while responding to a call on the city's west side. The niece of the victim, Belinda Herrera, 
identified him as Feliciano Jimenez. Savannah's video shows Jimenez moments before he was hit at a convenience store. His family says he was checking his bank account to see if he had enough for groceries. Converse police are investigating a late night shooting. It happened last night, a little after nine in Converse. Investigators say one person was shot twice in front of his home. He was rushed to the hospital in critical condition. Several shots were also fired at a neighboring house. Fortunately, no one was hurt inside there. We begin with arrest made in a deadly shooting that happened two weeks ago on the north side. 35 year old Kyle Jones being charged with murder in the death of 26 year old Jerome Johns. This shooting happened back on February 21st. According to the arrest affidavit, the two men had gotten into an argument and Jones allegedly pulled out a gun and shot Johns. The Woodlawn Theater is putting on a show that'll transport audiences to the 60s. We're talking with the cast about what audiences can expect when they watch Hairspray. It's a fresh um, show. Um, it's nothing that's like even like daunting or something that just makes you think too hard. It's one that just kind of draws you in and you have fun with it. It's like it's all it's all fun and games, but I really think to the core of the story is love and integration and what we all really need, I think, especially right now with everything that's going on in the world. And it's going to be cool tomorrow, chilly in fact, cloudy with morning sprinkles, struggling to get out of the 40s, nice and comfortable by Thursday though, 75, and then another front moves through, dropping temperatures down into the 40s, bringing us a light freeze Saturday and Sunday morning, so plan accordingly if you've done any spring gardening. All right, thanks, Sarah, and thank you for watching the news at 6. See you back here for the Night Beat tonight at 10. Until then, have a good evening.